Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Hello, Mark. Welcome back to Coast. Thanks for having me. Good to be here again. You're called a weird historian and also one of America's leading connoisseurs of the bazaar. How did you earn that noble description? I started a website in 2016 called Weird Historian because I do love just writing about weird history. And I've written a lot of books with that general theme. Um, so the site gave me a place to just write all kinds of different stories based on a pretty wide variety of weird historical moments. One of America's leading connoisseurs of the bazaar was a title given to me by Buck Wolf from ABC News uh, years back. He had uh, written a few reviews of some of my early books. One of them was about really weird things I found on eBay and all kinds of weird, bizarre things. And then also a book called American Sideshow. They covered a history of sideshow performers from the mid-1800s to the early 2000s. So he gave me that title, and I believe I've, I've lived up to quite nicely, um, I hope, with all my other books since then. You've written about everything weird and bizarre, ghosts, Mars, Oliver Cromwell's embalmed head, unorthodox messages from God, and much, much more. But now your latest book, We're Not Alone, The Extraordinary History of Aliens Invading Our Hopes, Fears, and Fantasies. What was your inspiration for this book and title? I love the title, We Are Not Alone. I just feel like it's, it's very declarative and provocative what is out there we don't know exactly but there's certainly a lot of evidence that points to something being out there and then the subtitle is the the extraordinary history of ufos and aliens invading our hopes fears and fantasies you know i think to some degree we all hope that we're not alone there's something comforting about knowing that we're not the only thing in the entire universe it's also a little bit scary you know what are these things are they going to be friendly are they harmful have they done anything to us uh, already and then our fantasies i mean we kind of imagine what things might be and in terms of my inspiration i've been fascinated by this topic since i was a kid and then when i did the mars book it's called the big book of mars that book got into a little bit of, of ufo history in the 40s and early 50s and so i kind of started touching on it there some a little bit of roswell the few things before and after and of course it's so relevant now i mean there's been so much conversation over the past few years and the congressional interest. Um, so it's it's been a great time to be writing about this topic. What makes this book, Mark, different from all other books out there that have been out there over the decades on the history of UFOs and aliens? And how did you pick the most weird or bizarre stories? So, of course, I cover off on some of the more known historical UFO cases, sightings, experiences. Uh, but I go from you know, early to mid 40s, um, even before Kenneth Arnold and Roswell, and I go up to to what's going on now, and I get into the behind the scenes of you know how these congressional hearings took place, how the 2017 New York Times article that really kind of broke the story open about the research into unidentified aerial phenomena began, and I get into a lot of the science as well in the book. Uh, so what scientists are doing, what their uh, efforts are within SETI, within Avi Loeb's Galileo project, um, different beliefs in extraterrestrial life that date back to the turn of the century Victorian era, and then just a range of different kinds of experiences from, from sightings to experiences to abductions and the contactees as well from the 50s, the people who thought they met Venusians. So I don't know that there's another book that covers as much about the topic, that widespread. In, in terms of picking the most bizarre stories, that was not easy <laughs> because there's so many and because of the breadth of the book i just described of course can only have so many pages i can fill so it is a little tough to try to find that balance of bizarre stories that are sort of known and finding some different angles to them or some new information and then some lesser known ones what's the most curious ancient alien story that you came across so th there's a lot of, of pretty curious ancient alien stories there was one i found that i thought was really quite unique this was the great airship flap of 1896 and 1897. This was a series of sightings that started really off the coast of California. And so just, you know, for a little context, this was, you know, several years before the Wright brothers took off at Kitty Hawk. Some airships may have been coming off the ground, but not piloted. 
So it was a very odd thing that people were seeing. But then there's all these reports you find in these newspaper archives of it continuing across the country. From state to state, people are seeing these things. Unusual airships are drifting through the sky. They're being described as egg-shaped or having you know a bird-like body. Um, they've got these brilliant searchlights that are being described in fan-like wheels. And they're going about 20 miles an hour, according to different reports. So again, this is like a, a series of stories going over the course of about five or six months. And there was one in 1897 in Aurora, Texas. And this one involved one of the airships that crashed. And people said that they found the body and that the body had come from Mars. And so this Martian body was supposedly recovered and it was buried in a local cemetery. So I love this story for, for a few reasons, because 1897 would be around the time when there was a lot of belief in intelligent life on Mars. This is also right around the time that H.G. Wells is writing War of the Worlds in a serial form, being published chapter by chapter before it came out as a full book novel. And then I also love it's 1897, and the town becomes this tourist destination to find this crash alien body. And that's, that's exactly 50 years before Roswell. Your first chapter opens with a really friendly greeting to Earthling readers with a visit to David Marler's Historical UFO Archive Museum, shall we say, in New Mexico. And then it takes us on to Roswell. And you also end up with a wild story about a top-shaped UFO. Tell us about that. Um, so David Marler has this amazing archive. He's just outside of Albuquerque. He's got all the Project Blue Book materials, all their files uh, he's got all kinds of ephemera, newspaper clippings, headlines, uh, recordings, you know, every media possible. So this this was incredible. He's actually now expanding it. Now it's called the National UFO Historical Records Center versus just, you know, David Marler's archive. So he's got an official thing going with this because it keeps growing. And then from there, I want to take a road trip to Roswell because how can you not? And because I mentioned I was going there, he told me he knew a guy there who had a UFO experience in 1964 when he was eight years old. And he was just playing, you know, just regular day outside. And he sees this object uh, a few stories up in the air across the street. And it, he said it was top shaped. And it's just kind of hovering there. And he's kind of moving left, moving right. And the thing is mimicking his motions, moving left, moving right. All of a sudden, it zips right over his head. And it just belches out this flame right over his head. And his grandmother had stepped outside and saw it. And, you know, he rushed over to her. The thing took off and he was burned. His fell like the neck up. He's just completely burned, rushed him to the hospital. And fortunately, there was a burn specialist at the hospital who helped him. But this this was a case that was documented in newspapers. He had the FBI investigating the story. This wasn't just like, oh, you know, he's making something up, right? This thing happened. FBI came investigate. They couldn't find any evidence of what would have caused this. There was nothing. They looked at all the different possibilities. You know, were there matches on the ground? Was, was there any evidence left behind that might explain it? And, and there wasn't. That was very odd. And, and when I talked to him, he hadn't talked about this case really since talking to the press in, in 1964. And really since then, he'd spoken to no one until David Marler found him a few years back. And then, and then I met him in Roswell for lunch. But what was so amazing too, and this is completely credit David Marler in the book, but as he researched that case, he found that there were other cases within the months before and after where top-shaped UFOs were being spotted, and they always seemed to be on Tuesdays. <laughs> this was just so weird. And again, no explanations for this on any of the cases. They, these were just cases that were happening with no explanation on Tuesday nights. But this happened, and of course, the book just gets into so much more after that. We can't talk about the extraordinary history of UFOs and aliens without mentioning our dear recently departed mutual friend, the legendary UFO researcher Lee Spiegel, who really left a huge mark in UFO history and whom you highlight in the book. Lee was hugely helpful in me being able to, to do this book. And so I, I, I owe him so much. And I'm so sad he's gone. It, it took me by surprise. Lee opened a lot of doors for me. I know I've known him for years. Uh, we both worked for AOL Weird News together. He was the UFO guy. I was the sideshow guy. And and he was terrific. He just was such a, a passionate, brilliant journalist who'd been studying this topic since the 70s. And, you know, Lee knew everybody. And I, I do talk about Lee's particular story. You know, Lee, of, of course, he had a fascination with the topic. Topic, but he had gotten to know J. Allen Hynek, who was you know, the main scientist behind Project Blue Book. And after Project Blue Book started the Center for UFO Studies called CUFOS. And so Lee was uh, working with him. And there was a case in Lumberton, North Carolina in the, the mid-70s. And J. Allen Hynek said he couldn't go to investigate it. So he sent Lee down. And it was a triangular UFO. 
he took a flight down to North Carolina right away, met with the police chief. They went out searching for it. And at first he told me, you know, they didn't see anything and they'd go from place to place and they weren't seeing anything. And finally they did see it and they pulled off the side of the road and it was him and the, the police chief and a, I think a few other, uh, I think officers and other witnesses as well. And they saw this triangular shaped craft um, about treetop level, completely silent. It blinked at them, shot a, like a light down at his feet. And, and then took off quietly. He said that they chased it for a while, but eventually, you know, kind of lost it. But there was never any explanation to this case. He wrote up his report. He investigated, spoke with people at the, the local Air Force base and checked on flight patterns, all these different kinds of things that maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but nothing synced up with what they experienced and what they saw. You write about another legendary case in UFO history where the witness recently passed away as well, and that was Calvin Parker from the Pascagoula incident of 1973. And you frame it with saying the two fishermen who got caught. What about that story piqued your interest? Well, this was one of the early abduction stories. You know, this followed, well, you had Betty and Barney Hill in, in 1973. Uh, 61. And this was, you know, these two guys just fishing um, in Pascagoula. And this craft comes down, this strange creature comes out, takes them aboard, does some weird experiments and puts them back. And these guys, you know, report it right away. They were terrified. Um, I spoke with Ray Stanford, who's a UFO investigator. And he told me that when he met with Charlie Hickson, who was, who was older than Calvin Parker, they were separated, they had a bit of an age gap between the two. He said that Charlie Hickson was incredibly credible. He said he never heard someone that was felt more genuine or authentic than anyone he'd spoken to on the topic. So he he felt very confident about Charlie Hickson's description of what he went through. They seem very positive that something happened. Was it a new UFO abduction? It could have been. And of course, I give some reasons in the book why they believe that. And there's another theory I talked about, which I thought was interesting. Uh, this was from a writer, Nick Redfern, who proposed that maybe this was related to something that was going on nearby, which was uh, on Horn Island, which was uh, just, just off the coast, where in the 50s and 60s, CIA secret projects like MK Ultra were experimenting with different drugs, you know, L LSD and so forth and other kinds of hallucinogenics or, or whatever it could be to try to develop mind control or mess with the brain, control the brain some way. And and that was supposedly stopped, but these secret projects kind of went on um, at least till the 70s. So maybe some of this was going on and kind of wafting through. They stopped it because they said that the fumes were kind of wafting over and could reach people. I just thought that was an interesting theory. But again, just kind of adds to the, to the lore of all of it, of what exactly happened to these two guys. Fascinating guy, Cheryl. Yes, he is, and there's so many more fascinating stories in his book, but the great thing about his book is that he has a lot of supporting graphics and clippings, and I guess it was really, really a fascinating time to spend so much time with David Marler in his uh, UFO archive. His book, We Are Not Alone, is the same title that the original Walter Sullivan from the New York Times wrote. Well, I guess that's good. He, that's why he has the uh, subtitle of The Extraordinary History of UFOs and Aliens Invading Our Hopes, Fears, and Fantasies. So Martin does take a different twist. He looks at things through a unique lens. It's kind of like a Twilight Zone view of things and looks for the weird and the bizarre and, and very unusual. And uh, when we come back, we're going to hear more about some really strange stories from about uh, rather about aliens, UFOs, hybrids, and believe it or not, also about fairies. And there's really no other way to verify some of these stories, like the one with the eight-year-old guy from um, Roswell that he met. Um, but there is a newspaper clipping in his book, and um, he says that uh, it's up to you what you want to believe. How long has he been at this? Uh, as far as writing books, he's been at it a long, long time, several years. And uh, he's been a guest on the coast, but it's been years ago um, uh, that, that he has yeah. been on the show. But uh, he just decided he wanted to write about the strange stories that he kept coming across in the world of ufology, UAPs, and aliens, of course. He loves these weird things, doesn't he? And he's excellent at it. He has a, a way, he has a knack about looking at something and seeing the odd and the unusual and has a certain twist. It's like the Twilight Zone twist. How did you find him? I know he's been on our program with us. He's been with me, but how did you find him? Yes, well, 
I've known Lee Spiegel, uh, the late Lee Spiegel. Yeah, he we, was a dear friend. I miss him. Yes, and we worked together on a project. And um, some time ago, I guess it was over a year ago, when I did the keynote at uh, MUFON International Symposium in Denver, um, Lee had told me that, that his friend Mark Hartzman was going to be there, and he wanted us to meet because he thought he would be someone I'd like to interview. And, of course, sure enough, I, I was interested. And so we met there, and then we continued uh, conversation throughout the, the uh, time. And then his book came out just a few weeks ago, um, actually, I think on the 17th, not a few weeks, a little over a week ago. And uh, here we are. We are not alone. The extraordinary history of UFOs and aliens invading our hopes, fears, and fantasies. It's a great title, isn't it? Well, it sure is. But his book covers a whole lot of things, a lot of paranormal things. But um, in my part two with Mark, the weird historian, he certainly continues that Twilight Zone type story that is so strange and bizarre, and uh, that that he found when he was working with David Marler, and he spent some time going through all of David Marler's history books, clippings, and documents, and all kinds of memorabilia that uh, David had accumulated. There's so many oddities, and in this uh, part two, he'll talk about uh, an oddity about Mars. He'll talk about hypnotic regressions and hybrid children, and also a strange abduction by fairies from the 1600s. That you might say these are far out stories from the ancient past to modern day, and they certainly are. It goes all the way from the famous to the obscure. So in this part two, we'll have another strange but true story that you may not have heard that involves a past presidential candidate and how this man claimed that an extraterrestrial influenced his political decision. Here now is my part two conversation with the weird historian Mark Artsman. You have so many astounding stories in your book, including contactees and abductions, and one was Gabriel Green, who ran for president in 1960 because he said spacemen told him to. Tell us about that. So the contactees, just for some quick background, this was really a something was going on in the 50s and in the early 60s. This group of, of people who believed that they were contacted by uh, extraterrestrials who landed. Usually they were Venusians who looked just like human beings, but maybe dressed differently and like nice blonde hair was a, a frequent description. And so they had a lot of different thoughts. And, and oftentimes it was these messages about the dangers of the atomic age and we're getting too close to damaging the Earth and the, the solar system or the universe. So almost like they were warning us to stop this. So one of these contactees was a guy named Gabriel Green. And he claimed uh, that the spacemen, as he termed them, told him to run for president in 1960. So he actually got himself uh, on a ticket, at least for a little while. He eventually dropped out. Um, but he was running against John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon in 1960. And I have in the book this wonderful ad that was running in the newspaper, America Needs a Space Age President. He was definitely before his time. He'd certainly fit right in here now in our upcoming <laughs> election. <laughs> And the abduction stories that you cover in your book, particularly one that has impacted pop culture from Kim Carlsberg from Baywatch. Tell us about that. I met Kim Carlsberg last year. Uh, I was at the MUFON International UFO Symposium in Denver, and she was selling a book called The Art of Close Encounters that she had put together, which is a beautiful hardcover book that shows lots of artwork from different people who have either experienced uh, UFOs or aliens, or just been inspired. So I told her about the book I was writing, We Are Not Alone. And I asked her if if I could talk to her, if she had experiences. And she proceeded to tell me about uh, a lot of really amazing experiences. And so you, you mentioned Baywatch. So she was the camera woman for Baywatch, which I thought was was pretty interesting. You know, Pamela Anderson and David Hasselhoff, um, pretty popular show in the, I guess that was late 80s, early 90s. So she had claimed to have been abducted many times um, over the years, and that she had hybrid children from these these encounters. And so she discussed meeting one of the hybrids who visited her home and finding you know that to be an extraordinary experience that he came to to her home and she tried to get her camera. She's a camera woman. You think she'd have photos, but she said her equipment was locked up and she couldn't get to it in time before he was going to leave. So she didn't have any photos, but still an amazing story. And what I love about this is not just this abduction story and that she believes that she has these hybrid children, um, which is really remarkable, but 
but I love the fact that this is one abduction story that whatever you choose to believe, it, it's impacted pop culture because as she told me, everyone on the Baywatch set knew about her experiences. The abduction of Anne Jeffries by fairies is another amazing story. It's really hard to make this stuff up. This one I thought was particularly interesting. This was in 1645, an abduction story. And it's one of these cases where this person, uh, her name was Anne Jeffries, as you mentioned. So she claimed that she was in her garden. This was in Cornwall, England, by the way. And she was basically plucked from her garden by beings that she called fairies. And she said that she was just out there in a the garden uh, knitting some stockings. And all of a sudden, she said six small people, all in green clothes, so little green men or women, had scared her and then basically swept her up into the air and took her off to, quote, some distant place flying through the air. She said she was whirled through space. And then found herself back in the garden, surrounded by a crowd who was witnessing her basically suffering from convulsions. And she said that the fairies continued to visit her over the next year, but no one ever saw them who was with her. So it's a curious story. So you wonder, okay, did she have some sort of alien abduction experience back in the 17th century? Or this kind of gets into a little bit of a theory that, that Jacques Fillet has proposed, um, the idea that there's a commonality between different kinds of beings from folklore. And could these all be existing in some alternate dimension or parallel dimension to us? So it's, a, it's another interesting thought, but I thought finding a story like that from 1645 was, was quite fascinating. Now, you also have a strange story in your book about David Huggins and the hybrid aspect. Yeah, so David Huggins is an artist who claimed to have had experiences from when he was a child growing up in rural Georgia. Uh, and then when he was about 17, he claimed to have had a very, very close relationship with a, a female uh, extraterrestrial who called herself, or he called her Crescent. I think he was in Georgia when he was growing up, moved up to New York, still had these encounters over the years. But it wasn't something he really thought much about, or the memories maybe got kind of buried until he saw Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders. And he read about these other cases of people having these encounters, and they all started coming back into his head, like all these memories started filling his head again. And so he started painting all these experiences that he remembered. And I have a couple of the paintings reproduced in the book. They're beautiful, and they depict what he remembered. And, you know, whether these things happened or not, as he tells the stories, uh, he's he's confident that these are the things that happened to him. He has no no doubt in his mind. And he has hybrid children, he said, from these these close relationships. Barbara Lamb is an amazing hypnotherapist and says she has been a hypnotherapist to thousands of people. What attracted you to that story to put in your book? Well, I was really interested in this idea of hypnotic regression and what people were experiencing through that and the stories that they were remembering through that process. And I wanted to talk to different therapists who practiced that to see what their thoughts were on it and how accurate that might be. So so Barbara Lamb was one of the ones I was able to speak to. And I don't think I knew she'd worked with thousands of patients until I spoke with her. I just knew that she had worked with patients. And so I was actually amazed that she'd worked with that many. And she described how people have just had these different sorts of marks that they might wake up with that weren't there the night before. Maybe it's an indentation or a scar in a place that they couldn't have even reach if they wanted to. And they'd come to her and they'd have these hypnotic regression sessions and they would have these memories of, of some kind of alien encounter. Um, in some cases, she said that there might be some, I think she mentioned one, there was like a BB-sized implant in someone's arm and they couldn't explain how it got there. But she also talked about how in some cases, because that seems to be, I think, the typical things, oh, I was poked and prodded and probed and all these you know awful things. But she also talked about how some people had very pleasant memories that they thought they were being guided in some way to do good or, or had a better understanding of things or had hybrid children that they, they were proud of, not unlike what we talked about with Kim Carlsberg. Is there one piece of what you think may be the best example of potential scientific evidence that you've come across? I think there's a couple things that have been interesting. When I, when I explored the scientific efforts to, to find signs of extraterrestrial intelligence, one of them that pops up is called the WOW signal from uh, 1977, where this was from the, uh, the Big Air Radio Tower at Ohio State University. And it would basically print out its readings every day, every night, and scientists would kind of go through and, and analyze these to see if there's anything unusual or interesting in it. And one night, uh, this happened overnight for, I believe it was about 72 seconds, this reading came in, and a scientist named Dr. Jerry Eman was going through it the next day when he had the, the stack of papers delivered to him, and he sees the signal that came through. Basically, it's like a series of numbers. Usually, it's ones, twos, and threes, which is like background noise. This was 
uh, six and above in letters. And basically anything five and above was unusual. Once you got past nine, you went to letters. So having a six and going up in digits and going into the alphabet signified something very unusual. And so we thought this, this might be it. This seems like we've been contacted or there's something out there. So he believed it may have been extraterrestrial, but he also said he didn't have enough data to conclude that. But it's interesting. You know, maybe there's something there. There were some early strange beliefs about extraterrestrial life, particularly on Mars, that you write about in the science chapter, too. This is, in fact, what got me going on my Mars book, the big book of Mars, was these different beliefs. I, I really got pulled into this subject by a Martian woman whose name was Umaruru, who was contacting a man in London telepathically in 1926. And I saw that headline. I was looking for a story for Weird Historian, actually, about Nikola Tesla, who was also trying to contact Mars. But then as I researched that, I came across all the different stories that were happening around it. So you had a lot of really brilliant people who believed that intelligent life might exist there. In 1877, for example, Giovanni Scaparelli, who's an Italian astronomer, had spotted through his telescope this network of crisscrossing lines, and he called them canali, which translates to channels, which could be made naturally. But it got mistranslated to canals. And when people thought it was canals, that would mean it was artificially created. And so people started thinking, well, they must be amazing engineers to have created canals all across the planet. And the guy who was the most vocal about that was named Percival Lowell, who opened the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona in 1894. And he was drawing maps of what he saw and describing the scenario of a dying planet where Ice from the polar caps was was being melted and, and distributed, an irrigation system through these canals to distribute it to everyone on, on Mars. So you started having people imagining what life might be like. Is there one most bizarre, most mind-blowing historical UFO or alien item or story in your book, or are there too many to choose from? I'll go back not too far back in history, so it's within the realm of people having very clear memories still, is the Phoenix Lights in 1997, which is such an unusual story because this was thousands of people that witnessed this in Phoenix, this giant triangular spacecraft or object going above them again quietly. The, the Air Force tried to explain the way that they had some, some testing going on with some of its aircraft and dropping flares. That's what people were seeing were these flares. But then people described the motion they were seeing, which just does not seem to coincide with the motion of a flare being dropped. So it leaves you wondering, okay, well, what were these people seeing and how were thousands of people seeing it? And this, this included the governor of Arizona, who initially kind of made a mockery of it at the press conference. But later became quite vocal about the fact that he had gone out and he had seen it and he didn't know what he saw, what was going on in Phoenix in 1997. What did people see? And we still don't know. And Dr. Lynn Katai personally photographed and videotaped this event as well. And she, of course, is a friend of Coast and has been on our show. Yes, I spoke with her. I have a few great quotes from her in the book. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating case. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight on Coast and bringing us all up to date on some of the more surprising and mind-boggling things you've dug up on UFOs and alien lore and history over the decades. Well, thanks so much, Cheryl. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. What a great guest, Cheryl. Oh, he was terrific. His stories are so fascinating, and he writes in such an entertaining way while he does something very important, in my view, and that's preserving history. People can judge for themselves what they want to believe, but one thing about Mark's book that it does, entitled We're Not Alone, he shows plenty of graphics, old clippings, photos, and all those support his stories. And it shows the difference in reporting of sightings of UFOs and extra, extraterrestrial or alien stories over the years. It's how much it's changed dramatically from the ancient past to our current times. And I think it's really important that historical information is preserved as much as possible today. All of the history, whether it's fact, fiction, or lore, it still reflects the culture because in today's news world, as you know, so much of history is ignored or forgotten, possibly purposefully at times. But as time marches on, we lose so many very important people and records about events, about the total history of UFOs and aliens and other related worldly events. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to Robert in New York. Let's go to Joe in Long Island. There you go, Joe. You're participating in our double calls tonight. I'm double tipping here. That, that could be the costume, right? Uh, how do you like that? Uh, how do you like that new little policy? Uh, well, I, I think it's good because sometimes, uh, you know, people people are trying to uh, participate in both. You know. Uh, 
that type of thing. Yeah, and they're two different forms. You know, the open lines are different from the guest calls. Yeah. Before I get to my question for Cheryl, uh, on the WHO, I did read an article on my site where University of Chicago law professor on international law went over the treaties that they're trying to do and called them a despicable organization. But uh, my question is, uh, you know, I I think you were a fan, Cheryl, of Gone with the Wind, right? Uh, And I thought the ending of that movie, I'm not sure if I would have ended the movie like that, where they separated. I'm wondering if you read Margaret Mitchell's second book on that. No, I haven't. I'd like to, yeah. but I haven't read it yet. Yeah. Yeah. What did, uh, what did you like about it, Joe? I just thought it was uh, just a fascinating character. Uh, a couple of things was uh, she may, she had this obsession with Ashley uh, and didn't pivot to, like, a second-choice guy and uh which was which was fine the the Clark Gable character, you know she never really got over her obsession and they but yet you know she and another thing was just some of the haunting scenes when Atlanta was burning she was went under a a a, a tunnel on horseback at night, a really riveting scene, and then she was a nurse on the field, and she was just like. Like, really, just what's happening? Like, all these people are just laying on the field with these injuries. Like, And she seemed like really otherwise, like the, a normal, level-headed person. And this carnage was around her, and I thought that was a fascinating contrast. Like, just how she was really, like, other, other than her obsession with the guy, she was really, like, kind of a strong, level-headed woman. And just the carnage around her was just like, she was just like, what's going on? You know? Joe, you got to become a movie critic one day. He'd be pretty good, Cheryl, wouldn't he? I think he'd be excellent. Cool. Let's go next to Robert in New York. Welcome to the show. Hey, Robert. Well, thank you, uh, George. Great to always speak to you again. And hey, uh, Thank you, sir. As a loyal listener, and i um, like to ask Cheryl if uh, she has... Or if Mr. Hartsman's has any specific um, um, knowledge regarding orbs, and as someone who has experienced orbs right up and close, several of them uh, over uh, a period of time, they seem to have uh, an intelligence because they don't just flash; they they move, they blink on, they blink off. And I had one flash right in the. Uh, in my face years ago, looking through a screen in the in the window, uh, uh, and um, it came right up that close. It was there was nothing there, and all of a sudden it flashed on and literally temporarily blinded me for a while. And it felt like I had just been through uh, having a an, uh, an X ray. I, I closed my eyes, and and it felt like I could see my skeleton. Orbs are pretty fascinating, Cheryl. Have you had any experience with them? Uh, they are pretty fasc- fascinating, and a lot of people uh, report that they've had those experiences. I've only had one picture that had a a very visible orb in it, and uh, that was a long time ago, and and it was in a barn <laughs> on the farm that I grew up on. So, uh, but but it wasn't during the time that I was on the, the that I lived on the farm, but years later. But it's very very strange, and a lot of people associated a, a lot of paranormal events uh, along with those. During World War II, pilots saw little orbs flying all over the place. They called them Foo Fighters, and uh, they look like and appear to have some intelligence behind them. Uh, yes, that seems to be the uh, a very common association with them, and that is something, George. I just don't know that we will ever really know all the answers to all of these things that we want to know about that that are so mysterious, because it seems like the control of that information to us is not in our control. 
That's a good point. Cornelius is with us in Louisiana. Hello there, Mr. White. Welcome to the program. Hey there, George and Cheryl. Uh, now, George, I just told Tommy a minute ago um, that demon video is Cornelius Lawson White on YouTube, but say demon video and, it, and it'll show up or type in demon. Okay, video. I'm going to watch that. Okay, but it would be great for a carousel because here you got a coast caller that has actually had a demon in the city council of Alexandria, Louisiana. Now, uh, with you, George, and you just had Joe from Long Island on, and I guess he called in earlier on the first guest and stuff. I I kind of disagree with you on, on having that thing because there are people that's been trying to get in for years, and, and they just never have been able to get in because I've talked to some of them. And but you have a right to do what you. This is your show. You run it the way you want to. Just like when you said Ian Punnett, no regular callers for Ian Punnett. I don't want them. But um, Cheryl, I was wanting to talk to uh, Karen Wilkerson, and I told Tommy yesterday, being an African American. That was yesterday's I, guest. Huh? That was yesterday's guest. Yeah, yesterday. But I know. But I wanted to tell Cheryl, and I wanted to tell. Her, but anyway, on yesterday's guest and Cheryl too. African Americans, have you ever heard of them being abducted, male or female? I know Barney Hill was, but have you ever heard of any female abductees? God bless you, George. God bless you, Cheryl. Y'all take it easy now. Thank you. I'm sure there have been some Cheryl, but uh, I don't know the names of them. Do you? I don't either. It's, uh, it's too bad he, he left the, the line because he perhaps may have known more about that than than we know off the top of our heads. But Barney Hill, of course, he was African-American, and he was one of them who was abducted back in the, the early 60s. Right. That's, uh, that's true. Um, right. I, I don't know. Next up, let's go to John in Wisconsin. Take it away. Hi, John. Hello, George. Hello, Cheryl. Just have a couple of quick comments, please. Um, Cheryl, I wanted to thank you for your contributions to Coast to Coast. Uh, I look forward to the last Thursday of the month and uh, your investigative reporters. And uh, It's always interesting. Uh, you ask good questions and you have good clarity and wisdom. And I want to thank you uh, for that, Cheryl. And then my other comment is I just wanted to thank Coast to Coast for being a place where anybody can call in and George respects the guests, he respects the callers. And I tell people in my little realm where I live in Wisconsin that coast to coast brings healing, peace, and harmony. And Cheryl, your segments always bring interesting new things for us to learn. And so I just wanted to thank both of you and encourage you both to keep up the good work. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And uh... Very kind of you, John. And, and yes, that's one thing, long before I ever thought about becoming uh, a part of Coast to Coast, uh, I, I was a listener way back in the Art Bell days. Um, I always thought the very same thing and the very point that he brought out, how nice it is, no matter what the guest says or their opinion, they are truly welcome, uh, the callers as well, because it is a place where you can express your opinion without uh, – being criticized or yelled at or thrown off the show. <laughs> Can you believe it's coming up in April? Six years since Art has passed on? It doesn't seem Six that Six years, my gosh. I was on the show with him once when Richard Hoagland uh, and I both were down at the Miami Circle story. So we were kind of uh, teaming up and, and both on the show at the same time. Where'd the time go, Cheryl? It just flies by. It just flies by. I really kind of think we're in some sort of a time warp sometimes. When Kenneth Arnold discovered the, the flying disks back in 1947, I don't think they called them UFOs then, did they? Flying saucers. They were flying saucers. That's what they were, and then we kind of changed it. UFOs and now to UAPs, but I don't think the UAP has really stuck as well as they hoped it would. It just doesn't roll off the tongue. What are you going to say? UAPology? Or you are apologizing? Let's go to Denver in Jackson, Mississippi. Hey, Denver. Well, good evening, and thanks for this opportunity to communicate on Coast to Coast. Thank you, And sir. I'm praying and 
that you and Cheryl be blessed because I appreciate the work that y'all are doing. Well, we're very kind but, of you. Thank you. But two things I'd like to uh, talk about. Uh, the sighting I experienced while I was living in Topeka, Kansas in 1976 and about uh, Riley Martin. Cheryl, did Cheryl ever read the book that Riley Martin wrote, The Cunner of Ten? Did you read Riley Martin's? He used to be on our show a long time ago. No. Tell me about uh, what you're asking you about. Need to. You need to read it because in 1953 he was seven years old and he was abducted. And they would come back every 11 years and pick him up. And they let it go on for 33 years. Then they gave him permission to have hypnotists put on him. He was hypnotized. All his memory came back. But I was so amazed with his book. He was Afro-American. He was Afro-American. Yep. I emailed him. And then we talked on the phone several times. And we got into a good conversation. And I really was impressed with his experience. And these people that picked him up were 600 million years more advanced than we are. But they didn't know everything, you know. And they explained to him they contact us by our DNA, not by random pickup, you know. Interesting take. A nice little puppy in the background. I love little animals like that, Cheryl. That's not mine. <laughs> no, that was his. <laughs> but it sounded like a little what? A little chihuahua? Could be. Thanks for the call, Denver. Coast listeners are like family, Cheryl. You know that? Uh, yes, they are, because it takes a certain kind of person to be as loyal as the listeners are to Coast. And, uh, you know, my hat's off to you and, and obviously to the late Art Bell because what you two did um, is just really incredible, and it, uh, it's, it's just phenomenal. Can you believe I'm going into my 21st year doing this program? It's hard to, hard to believe that. My I, gosh. I, I know it. It just is amazing, and I'm going into well. I've I've been with you guys for four years now. But you, by the way, are ageless. I remember trying to hire you in Detroit as a weathercaster when you were in Kansas City, and you were just a kid then. I guess I was. I didn't realize it. I say I was three at the time, but uh, yes, I <laughs> been th- time. Uh, we wonder what you know what our paths would have been had we taken different pathways or made different choices. That was always a very difficult thing for me to do. I I looked at everything upside down all around, and when I had to make those decisions at the end of every contract, what was I going to do? Which job was I going to take? I was fortunate that I had a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities come my way. But I just wasn't psychic to see into the future to be sure that the one I was taking was the right one. Let's get a quick question in from you, Alex, in Delaware. Go ahead, Alex. Hey, George. I've been a longtime listener since 98, uh, about a first-time caller. Thank you. And I'm going to throw a wrench into this whole thing. Um, All right. I think nobody has seen this angle before. What if we have this all backwards and everybody thinks that these are aliens? What if this is really... God's way of keeping an eye on us. And this is, there are no aliens. These are just the form that angels and demons take on. And and they keep an eye on us and they come by and they visit and they, they, they see us and they interact. But there are really no aliens. This is just, you know, angels and demons. Maybe the fallen angels that the Bible talks about. You can't rule that out, Alex, because that is a possibility and there are some people in the field of ufology who still believe the fact that UFOs and ETs are demons and uh, not very, they're kind of nefarious. Uh, not easy, Cheryl, is it? It's not easy. Uh, likewise, there are people, plenty of people, who believe that, that there are some very good healing uh, aliens, and there's a lot of history on that. Uh, and then a lot of people believe that, that it's like everything else. There are good and evil um, aliens. And I, who knows? We don't know. We, we, we can't prove what we believe. But if I had to bet and I was really making a choice, my guess would be that there are uh, both good and, and evil. Cheryl, thanks for everything you do for us. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I love the callers. A lot of people want to know about tarot cards, witchcraft, and the occult. And the author, Marcus Katz, he's the one who knows about all of them.
Where are you? Way out in the United Kingdom? Um, yes, that's right. I'm in a very small cottage out in the woods in the Lake District of the United Kingdom where there's an owl hooting outside um, this morning. <laughs> I think it's a cockerel. It's trying to tell people to wake up. <laughs> I love it. What time is it out there? Um, it's um, just at 8, um, 10 what? past 8 a.m. Yeah, in okay. And uh, I'm in the, the Midwest right now where it's 2.10 in the morning. And then uh, so we're already time traveling together. That's yes, excellent. we sure are. We sure. Hey, beyond the bio, tell me a little bit more about yourself and your interest in in all this. Okay. Well, um, um, uh, first of all, just a quick shout out to all of the people on your uh, very engaged Facebook group, <laughs> which um, Great. Um, are doing a, a blue by blue commentary of um, the interviews, which I perhaps shouldn't have read in advance of, of this. <laughs> Um, but I first learned um, to get engaged with magic um, at school. Um, I went to a really progressive school here in the UK, and um, our religious studies class actually brought in a teacher, um, a new age teacher, or somebody to talk to our class about the new age. And this lady brought in um, a, um, a pendulum, a dowsing rod, a pack of tarot cards, astro astrology charts and um, we had a two-hour lesson on um, on basically the esoteric the occult um, fortune telling prediction and astrology and we were all told to go out dowsing um, as our sort of school activity that afternoon and um, some friends and I went out dowsing with these homemade uh, dowsing rods from um, metal coat hangers and um, biro pens um, big biro pens um, and um, we found this line running across the playing fields, and we went back to our, our teacher and said, um, this is really odd, it, it seems to work. We've, we found this line, and he said, well, uh, uh, what, what are you going to do about that? Apply it scientifically. And so we went and found the janitor. Um, in here, here we call it um, it's the caretaker, but the janitor, and um, we asked him to find the maps for the school. Uh, we found the maps, and um, surely enough, we'd found the, um, the water pipe that ran underneath the playing field from the tennis court to the swimming pool. And I was completely blown away. I thought that, that there are things we can't see. There are things that we can't sense somehow. And there are these hidden mysteries buried under the ground. And um, I went and made myself a tarot deck that weekend, started reading tarot. And um, here I am about 35 years later with um, 10,000 readings or so um, behind me. <laughs> well, good for you. Good for you. Were you fascinated with magic when you were a little yeah. boy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, astral travel, um, uh, Doctor Strange, who's about to make his own cinema um, screen comeback, um, all of that sort of thing was um, fascinated me. So um, I remember buying a book on magic, um, a very cheap book. Um, it was almost, a, it wasn't quite mail order, but it was equivalent. Um, and it had a spell in. The book was called winning with witchcraft and um, the spell was simply to get a coin and to wave it at the moon and to recite this particular spell so i think i was about 13 i went outside that night and um, i only had a, um, a small coin like a, a, a one pence piece or a five pence piece and i waved it at the moon and i earnestly um, recited this little spell and um forgot about it. The following morning, um, my dad, who'd been out um, that night, and that's why I was able to stand outside the house and chanting um, weird occult spells at the moon, um, uh, my dad, in the morning at breakfast, he said to me, well, um, you know, last night I, was, I had to go and pick your grandfather up from the train station and stuff like this. Um, now, um, he wanted to pay me for petrol, but... Um, um, I, I said I, I didn't want the money, but he insisted, so I thought I'd give it to you. And my dad handed me this five-pound note. So <laughs> I was completely blown away. And 
the way this thing was, was the first thing, and this happens a lot with magic, the first thing I thought was not, my God, I did this money spell last night, and magic works, and the whole occult world has opened up to me. The first thing I thought as a 13-year-old was, I wonder what would have happened if I'd have weighed more money at the moon. <laughs> Exactly. Maybe I would have got more money. But the interesting thing with that, and the thing that I keep coming back to in later years, is, um, and this sort of, I guess, fits the time travel theme of, of, of the show at the moment, is that the money had already been given to my father before I did the spell. Uh, how did that so, happen? Well, I started to think that perhaps... Um, that time doesn't quite work the way we think it does. And um, I'm huh. no expert in, in the realms of time travel or um, uh, time science, but I do know from um, 35, 40 years of doing spells that um, time, and, and also prediction as well through, um, uh, through fortune-telling, through tarot, um, there's something there's something definitely amiss with our perception of time, and perhaps it will take us a, a long time, if you'll pardon the pun, to actually um, work it out. Yeah. But it, it's, uh, it's certainly um, observable and manifest when you get involved in occultism and when you do spells, when you do um, uh, tarot readings and so forth. Did you ever, even during uh, your initiation ever get involved in something that you thought was a little dangerous or something you shouldn't be dabbling with? Well, I think I've, I've been rather lucky over, over the years because, um, strangely enough, I mean, over the years, the only sort of hate or conflict, for example, um, which can be somewhat dangerous, I have had um, um, more recently a death threat, um, has always come from within mm. the communities that I've been involved with. Um, within the tarot world or within the uh, esoteric world. It's never come from, you know, um, um, secret orders thinking that I'm going to reveal their secrets or uh, Christian fundamentalists or um, scientists or any other group. I've, I've always seemed to have, um, touch wood, managed to get along um, with um, um, most groups. However, I, th I think the psychological dangers of working with occultism um, are probably perhaps what, what, uh, far more prevalent than... Um, I, I have seen people sort of become obsessed or possessed by the things that they've been working with, and um, that's not all the way into the whole paranormal sort of realm of... Um, um, you, you know, spirit possession and things like this. It's um, that they, they've become completely disassociated with normal or everyday or mundane or common reality. And I think it's very important to keep um, uh, keep a grip of every world that you're functioning in, whether it's the esoteric, the astral, the etheric, um, the spiritual, or or the everyday world of perception. So Mark I, I think that's where where dabbling can go go a little bit wrong. Um, yeah. Marcus, I've always thought tarot was merely to be read by the user about someone else, but you've used it uh, in terms of casting spells and using it as magic. How does that work? Well, um, there are a, a lot of different ways of using tarot. Um, one of the greatest things of the um, Internet over the last few years has been um, uh, the, 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 the sheer diversity of divination that, that we've seen, particularly in our Facebook group. I mean, we have about uh, something like 22,000 people in our Facebook group now for tarot. And yet there's a massive diversity um, of um, ways of using tarot. Um, one of the particular ways we've started to use it a lot is what we call gated spreads. And the gated spread is a method by which you do a tarot reading like people would be familiar with. But then the tarot reading is designed to actually provoke some action in your life. So, for example, um, you might do a tarot reading for, um, uh, we might tell people to 
do a tarot reading that will determine how they're going to act during that day. Are they going to act like the King of Cups and be all emotional, or are they going to act like a King of Wands and be very dynamic and argue with people, argue their own points, and and be very um, um, uh, assertive in the world that particular day? And then what we do is the second day, because these experiences last about a week usually, give them another spread or have already developed another spread that then takes what happened to them during that day and it feeds it into that other spread like a sort of gateway. Um, So, for example, if that person um, was uncomfortable at some point acting out as another part of their personality during the day, then the second spread says, taking that discomfort, what does the tarot have to teach you for tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And basically, it provides a series of engineered spreads for the person to change their life over the course of a week. And that can lead to, um, we have gated spreads for um, promoting creativity, but also talking to the ancient Egyptian god Thoth, Um, using Alistair Crowley's Thoth deck, and we have all sorts of gated spreads for working with relationships, actually um, attracting a relationship and working with a relationship and things like that. So tarot can be used very uh, far more dynamically than than people think. It is is connected to the universe. It it arises in the universe just like we do, and um, therefore it can be uh, used as um, I think Kircher said um, about magnetism, it's like the invisible knots that bind the universe, and tarot is one of those knots that we can both tie different knots and unravel them um, by changing our own lives with it. Marcus, have you found that tarot or witchcraft uh, can be used for nefarious purposes uh, to get at somebody? Well, again, we, we, we do get this question a lot about curses and so forth. Um, my own view on that is that um, because of the way I've seen magic work, um, I think it's very, very difficult to pull off a nefarious stunt with magic. That's why um, most magicians aren't, um, you know, sort of living in um, vast... Um, um, uh, deserted volcano hangouts ruling the world. Um, well, as, as far as I know, um, but um, the, the the failsafe I think with magic is that the more you understand, the more you learn about both magic and mysticism, the less um, uh, the, the, the less desire you have really to um, towards very material or very egotistic things. So it, it has its own safeguard in that way. But also, as Alistair Crowley pointed out, the the trick with magic, and again, it's why, um, you know, we can't all immediately spend our lives waving pennies at moons or dimes at moons and um, becoming rich overnight. Otherwise, everyone would be doing it. Um, uh, the, the trick is what is called uh, working without lust of results. You have to want something absolutely and at the same time get out of its way, actually let go of it with the spell itself, with the, with the magical working. And so that's its own protection as well because it's very difficult to, um, for example, hate someone and be totally disengaged with that person um, uh, within oneself. So the actual state of being that you need to cast the spell outwards um, is very, very difficult to, um, to enter into, um, no matter what sort of ceremony or methodology you use. Um, so quite often those spells actually fester and rebound straight back to the person casting them right. because they cannot cast them out. I mean, that's why the word is casting a spell. You have to cast it out of you. And um, quite often people with nefarious um, ends in mind um, are very attached to those because it does give them some sense of power and control, and therefore it tends to eat them rather than the other person. We've always called it karma. What goes around comes around, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
that, that sense of cause and effect, um, the more spells that, that work for the person, the more you realize that everything is arising simultaneously, therefore everything's connected, therefore you better be careful even what you think because that is going to have some impact on the world that is being created around you. What a fascinating guy. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDesor, Stephanie Smith, Chris Boros, Tim Benal, George Knapp, and Ian Punnett, I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.